Good morning. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to Greenbelt Baptist Church. If you are a visitor with us this morning, we are especially grateful that you are here. You received a bulletin on your way in. There's a little portion at the bottom we'd love for you to fill out and tear off and toss in the offering box. We'd love to know that you are here and be able to reach out to you and answer any questions you may have for us about uh, who we are as a church, why we are gathered here, and any, anything else uh, that, that you might like to inquire of us. We'd be happy to do that for you. Uh, but we are gathered here in the name of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. It is Palm Sunday, and so we rejoice and we worship Him this morning, as we do every Sunday morning. And so I want to begin our time this morning by reading uh, from Matthew 21, the passage uh, that um, describes the triumphal entry. So let's uh, 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 follow along or listen as I read, and we will worship our great Savior this morning. <coughs> now when they knew, drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village <coughs> in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them on, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant, and they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer as we worship him. Our great Heavenly Father, we rejoice this morning in the great gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we sing Hosanna. We sing praises to you for all that you have done for us. And Lord, we acknowledge this morning that we are totally and entirely unworthy of your grace and your mercy towards us. But Father, we, we thank you that in your great mercy you have sent your son Jesus. You have chosen out of your love for us to save us. And Father, we rejoice this morning and, and we acknowledge that even out of the mouths of infants and babies you have ordained, ordained praise. And so, Father, we want to join in that chorus this morning. And so we ask that as we sing and as we hear from your word this morning, as we partake of the supper that you have given us to remember the death of Jesus, we ask that you receive all the honor and the glory for all that you have done. And Lord, we also ask that, that we be sanctified in our time this morning, that we be conformed into the image of our Savior. Lord, we pray that this would be a house of prayer, that, that our church would be a place where your name is exalted and praised, where we come before you seeking your face, because we know that all, all our needs are answered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
We thank you for that this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together from the hymnal number 575. My heart is filled with thankfulness. songbook number 45 praise god and this is the tomb of the doxology praise god from whom all blessings flow In heaven above and earth below, praise God the Father and the Son, praise God the Spirit. Dwell beneath the sky. Let the Creator praise our Let all
eternal are your mercies, Lord. Eternal truth attends your word. Your praise will sound from shore to shore. sun shall rise and set no more. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we approach the table to take it, to remember the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and Paul commands us to do so in a worthy manner. He says if we do it in an unworthy manner, we eat and drink judgment upon ourselves. And so we, we want to take a few moments to examine our hearts, to see in what manner it is we come to the Lord's table. And in context, uh, what Paul is saying is, especially in our relationship with one another, if we have something against a brother or a sister, if we've offended a brother or a sister, it's, it's wise for us and good for us to perhaps let the, the bread in the cup pass because we are unreconciled with a brother or sister. So let's, let's examine our hearts now even just a few brief moments of prayer, private confession, examining our hearts, allowing the Spirit to show us those ways that we've sinned against God and against our brother and our sister. So I'll allow a few brief moments of silent prayer, and then I will lead us in a time of uh, con corporate confession together. Our Heavenly Father, we do humble ourselves before you this morning, acknowledging and recognizing the depth of sin that still resides in us. Lord, we, we like Paul in Romans chapter 7, do the things that we know we shouldn't, and we don't do the things that we know we should. We know that our flesh still wages war within us. And the tempter comes and tempts us. Tempts us to trust in our own self, in our own ability, in our own righteousness. Thinking that there is something worthy in us that can make us right with you. Father, we confess that we have too often believed those lies. We confess, Father, that we have trusted in ourselves and not purely and totally in you. Father, we confess to you that we have lived this week too often for ourselves, for our own glory, for our own fame, for our own satisfaction and comfort and pleasure. And Father, we have not very often looked up and looked around us to see our brothers and sisters who are in need our brothers and sisters who are hurting, our brothers and sisters who are struggling in various aspects of their lives. Father, we are yet still a selfish people, concerned too often with ourselves only, and not with those that you have
graciously put into our lives. Father, perhaps even this week, as perhaps we've been approached by a brother or sister for some sin in our lives, we've reacted instead of humbly and listening with anger, with excuse, with self-justification. And Father, we, we recognize and we, we are thankful that you do place us in a corporate community. You have given us one another for our own good, for our sanctification. And yet, Father, we too often look around at those who you have put in our lives with judgmental eyes, with suspicion. Oh, Lord, would you, would you bind our hearts together in unity? Lord, we thank you that you have given us this meal together. So simple in what it is, just some bread and juice. And yet, what it represents, that which it points, it points us to, is, is a life-altering truth. Oh, Father, would you in this moment remind us of our Savior, who shed his own blood on our behalf, who, though he knew no sin, became sin for us. Lord, this is grace and mercy beyond our imaginations. And we thank you for it. And we ask that in this time that we celebrate together the death of our Savior, that you would draw our hearts together in unity, that you would cause us to to look up and to open our eyes and to see our brothers and our sisters with whom we are united by faith. Oh Lord, would you, would you use this time to sanctify our hearts, to conform us into the image of our great Savior whom we celebrate even now. It's in his name we do pray. If I could have the deacons who will be serving the Lord's table come forward now. Paul says this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body, which is for us. The bread represents, is a visual symbol for us of the broken body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The cup, which we will celebrate in a minute, in a minute represents his shed blood for us. Our great and perfect Savior came out of heaven and died the most horrible death that we could imagine for us. This is what we celebrate. If you are a believer this morning, if you have placed your faith in Jesus as your only means of reconciliation with the holy and righteous God, if you've said, I can't do it on my own, I need Jesus to be my Savior, well then, we warmly invite you to partake of the Lord's Supper with us this morning. But if you have not done that, if you, if you haven't placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then we'll, we ask you to let the bread and the cup pass by you because it has no bearing on your life. And in fact, you eat and drink judgment upon yourself. But we ask that you would see what it is that we're doing. Meditate, contemplate on this that we do. And we, we hope that you would come talk to us, talk to anyone around you, come talk to the elders, and perhaps uh, we can share with you the gospel of our, of, of our Savior. And perhaps even next week, you could eat and drink with us as a brother and sister. In Christ. Now we, it is our kind of tradition here to take uh, the, the bread individually as a symbol of your individual union with Jesus Christ. And uh, you can save the cup and we will do that together as a symbol of our corporate union with one another and with Jesus Christ. The, uh, they come in one package and the, the ones in the middle are gluten free. So if you need those, please take those. If you don't need those, please let them pass for those that do. Let's distribute now.
The same way also Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim the Lord's death as we drink and as we eat together. We anticipate his return when we will eat and drink with him in his kingdom. So let's drink together now as we proclaim his death. Let's stand and sing together from the songbook, Blessed is the One. Blessed is the one whose sins are overcome, whom God has sheltered deep within his grace. And blessed is the Trust in God the Son, His steadfast love, the sinner's hiding place. Stop. 
sovereign care. And when the waters rise, a God will hear my cries. His steadfast love will hold me safely there. This morning's scripture reading comes from Isaiah 4, 40, 1 through 5, and is located on page 599 of the Pew Bibles. Isaiah 40, 1 through 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jer Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Let's turn to him, to him in prayer. Father, we lift up our eyes to the hills and ask, from where does our help come? Our help comes from you, O Lord who made heaven and earth, and who speaks comfort, comfort over all who turn to you. For you lead the blind in a way that we do not know, in a path that we have not known, you guide us. You turn the darkness before us into light, and the uneven places into level ground. For these are the things that you do, and you will not forsake us. For you forsook him, Jesus, our precious Passover lamb, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to you, O Father, that we may be called the children of God. For the glory of God has been revealed, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Father, we long to know you more, to see more of your beauty and glory. To that end, create and sustain a thirst within us that is only satisfied when we come to Jesus, who cries, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. For if anyone believes in me, 
as it is written, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And we pray for those who haven't yet tasted that the Lord is good, that you who said let light shine out of darkness would shine within our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for this body of believers that you have called out here in Greenbelt and for the under-shepherds you've entrusted over us. We ask that you'd help us live self-controlled and contented lives so that Christ may be honored and the word of God may not be reviled. Forgive us for our hypocrisy and we thank you for the furnaces of affliction in which we are tried and refined. Sustain us through them, O Sovereign Father. We also pray for Justice-elect Jackson in her new role on the Supreme Court of the United States. We ask that you'd give her wisdom and help her to serve in the strength that you provide so that in everything Christ may be glorified. Finally, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together with Aletheia as we remember the passion of Christ this coming Friday. We ask that you draw many to the service and that you'd help us all to behold the majesty of Christ, that we may walk away with a deeper desire for the one who has brought us peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing hymn 242. Hallelujah, what a Savior. sorrows. What a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Alleluia, what a vile and helpless we guilty vile and helpless we spotless lamb of God was he full atonement can it be hallelujah what a savior lift it up with to die. It is finished was his cry. And lifted up was he to die. It is finished was it. Now in heaven exalted high. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a say. Yes. 
Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke, <clears throat> Luke chapter 3. And I'll read this morning Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Luke 3, verses 1 through 20. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea, and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not exhort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them, all that he locked up John in prison." Uh, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. And let's pray to him now and ask him that he might not only bless the reading of his word, but our understanding of it, submission to it, in a way that honors and glorifies our God. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would now take your word, which is living and active, and apply it as a sharp two-edged sword into the depths of our hearts. Therein, Lord, convict us of sin, Draw us into true repentance, and Father, encourage us in faithfulness so that we might leave here better fit to boldly honor and obey our Savior Christ, resting in Him, trusting in Him, and living our lives as a bold and honest reflection of His resplendent glory. Move us now, Lord, by Your Spirit to find ourselves at the foot of the cross, Move us toward humility so that we might hear your word and respond in faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
except for the brief glimpse of Jesus as uh, a 12-year-old, which we looked at last week, <clears throat> darkness shrouds the first 30 years of the lives of Jesus and John. In the case of John, we know that as uh, a six-month-old in his mother's womb, he, he, he leaped at the sound of the Virgin Mary's voice, and thus we saw John's prophetic ministry actually begin three months before his birth. We've also learned that he was filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb so that John was always and fully set apart by the Spirit toward a particular ministry. We know that he was a disciplined man, having never partaken of wine or strong drink. And Luke tells us also that John grew and be became strong. Thank you. And that he spent his days in the wilderness until the time of his public ministry. And that's exactly where Luke picks the story back up for us concerning this strange prophetic man, John. We left him back in chapter 1. We left him in the wilderness. And now in chapter 3, here he is again, still out in the wilderness. But Luke takes pains to show us that John's ministry began not just in a geological desert, but also in a political desert. Do you see the detail the historian Luke gives to us concerning all the political power wherein this strange and spirit-led man is moved to fulfill his ministry? In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea, Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, and this is during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. But this is the background wherein John's gospel ministry emerges. It's a time of overbearing strongmen and tyrants. Kent Hughes comments that all seven of the civil names mentioned here evoke wickedness and intrigue. Even the religious names of Annas and Caiaphas project a, a degenerate priesthood. Annas had been priest from 6 A.D. to 15 A.D., followed then by his four sons and then eventually his son-in-law, Caiaphas. In other words, the priesthood was filled by nepotism and an evil concentration of power. That's the politically dark backdrop that makes verse 2 so glorious. It was during that time that the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now that's the main grammatical clause in verses 1 and 2. It's the focus. It's the main event. Luke's big idea. And look what Luke has done here. He's essentially trivialized all the major heavy hitters of the age, all the movers, all the shakers, seven of the world's most important men, men who can build and destroy nations with just a word. And yet, there's another word even more powerful, the word of God. And that word has come to some random Judean hillbilly wandering out in the desert and wilderness of Palestine. To be sure, that's the main emphasis of this entire passage. John, a prophet of God who preaches and proclaims the good news. Look how the passage both begins with John preaching. Verse 3 uses the word uh, to proclaim. And he went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then the passage ends with his preaching. Look at verse 18. It uses the words exhortation and preach. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. The big idea here is that there is scarcely anything more important than the public proclamation of God's word. Even, even the baptizing that John will do comes secondarily to his preaching. He preached, people repented, and then he baptized them. Their baptism was a sign and a symbol of their inward repentance. The power wasn't in being baptized. The power is in what John was preaching. Did you know that the ancient Jewish historian Josephus wrote about John the Baptist? He did. Listen to what he says. Quote, he was a good man 
and had exhorted the Jews to lead righteous lives, to practice justice towards their fellow men and piety towards God, and in so doing to join in baptism. In this view, this was a necessary preliminary if baptism was to be acceptable to God. That is, they must not get baptized to gain pardon for whatever sins they committed, but as a, consecrate, as a consecration of the body, implying that their soul was already thoroughly cleansed through repentance and right behavior. Josephus got John right. Josephus sounds like a Baptist to me. John the Baptist should really be called John the preacher. John the prophetic preacher. A man full of God's Spirit, preaching the Spirit-inspired Word of God with such effect that multitudes visibly fell under conviction so that they repented of their sins, came to be baptized, symbolizing their death to sin and their resurrection to new life. Just a side note, oh, that God would continue to do that even today. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and the same Spirit, and He still uses weak people, He still uses peculiar people, lowly people, to preach, and in the power of the Spirit, to bring countless others to true repentance and faith in God. Dear church, let's pray that God would still do that today. Stop and consider what John's preaching meant for the Jewish people who heard him, for those who considered themselves the covenant people of God. By and large, the Jews had little awareness of their need to repent. For them, it was little more than a nice add-on, a spiritual cleansing that maybe spruced things up. There were other Jews who practiced a kind of baptism. Mostly baptisms were relegated to Gentiles who were coming into the Jewish faith. Consider how striking that would have been for John to tell Jews, no, 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 you need to get baptized. Baptism within Judaism didn't generally represent a transformation from death to life or from judgment to forgiveness. Why would it? They were the covenant people, and they were enamored by the idea that their national heritage, through blood lineage, they were basically right with God. Other Jewish baptism practices were just seen as a a daily bath, a washing away of the insignificant sins of the day. But John's preaching and his call for repentance and baptism, this was different. What he meant by it was that they were no longer right with God. Their Judaism was no longer sufficient. John's ministry as a whole signified and was signifying a brand new era in the grand scheme of God's redemptive purposes. The inbreaking of the messianic age and a new beginning with God. One of the telltale signs that this was indeed a new era is what we see in verse 2. Again, verse 2 should absolutely stop us in our tracks. We're told... The word of God came to John. Now, we worked through the book of Jeremiah before we started our study in the Gospel of Luke. So you should remember how often we came across that line, the word of God came to Jeremiah the prophet, repeated throughout Jeremiah's prophecy. This is the language the Bible uses to denote a true prophet. But here's what I want you to see. There was a significant time actually about 400 years, where the word of God was not coming to prophets anymore. There was a silence from God. The Old Testament prophet Amos, in Amos chapter 8, actually foretold that there would be a significant time when there was an absence, a a famine of God's word through prophecy. And the context in in Amos chapter 8, if you want to look at it later, is that of judgment. God will take away his word from his people since they've decided they don't want to submit to his word anymore. To be sure, the people still had God's word in the scriptures, the Old Testament. But God wasn't speaking through people anymore. The time of special revelation through continued prophecy was seemingly over. There was nothing new being added. It had the effect of God backing away. But now, suddenly... God speaks again. And he doesn't come to the rich and powerful. 
Not even to the religiously impressive, the high priests of the day. No, he comes to this strange man out in the wilderness. John, a prophet. In fact, I think we could say he's the greatest old era prophet because God uses him to announce the coming of that long-awaited Messiah. What all the other prophets in the Old Testament looked forward to and talked about, John gets to be there as that Messiah steps out onto the scene. He's the MC that says, here he is. And Luke wants to prove this to his readers by quoting from Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, which Matt read for us and prayed out of earlier. Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5, which is quoted here, it was a well-known passage among the Jews. And it was a perfect passage for Luke's purpose. Luke sees Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5, being, being fulfilled in John's ministry. In fact, the early church, the early church even drew the title for their movement from John's words here in this passage. The first Christians didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves the way, which comes from this passage, viewing themselves as messianic believers, now walking along the way, first prepared by John and then finally established by Jesus. Something of the context of Isaiah 40 is helpful. It's interesting to note here, chapter 40 of Isaiah occurs right at the middle turning point in the whole prophecy of that book. It, it, it moves from the first half of this prediction of exile and wrath and judgment to now in chapter 40, verse 1, God's promise and declaration of comfort, comfort my people, and a, a restoration of his people. This is going to be accomplished in a return from exile. In the new covenant initiated by John and Jesus, a new return from exile would finally come, and the first step was taking place now in John's ministry. Luke places John the Baptist as the voice crying in the wilderness. John very likely went into the wilderness in the first place in order to fulfill this text. He knew, and the Jews at large all believed, that the final messianic renewal would begin out in the wilderness. It's there where the way of the Lord would be seen as a divinely established highway, a, a God-designed path where the final return from exile would happen, something that only the Messiah could bring about. But the picture being painted is of John, by God's help, removing natural obstacles that stand in the way and produce roadblocks to getting right with God. Valleys are being filled. Mountains are being flattened. In other words, nothing will be in the way to keep people from returning to God. Verse 5 is really describing something absolutely supernatural. All the valleys, mountains, and crooked roads will be smoothed and straightened. The path will be constructed in such a way so that apostate Jerusalem can become godly Zion once more when the Messiah comes. What Luke is doing here is he's picturing the coming of the Messiah to bring salvation. But notice, but notice to whom in verse 6. And all people will see God's salvation. As John and the faithful clear the obstacles, the people of God are enabled to see the Messiah come and to see God's salvation. The, the, the stress, though, is on all people, which would include not just Jews, but Gentiles. And that absolutely fits not only in this context, but really the entire context of all of Luke and Acts. That in the coming of Jesus, the Abrahamic covenant would finally be fulfilled and salvation is brought to all people and to all the world. John preaches this clearly here. Look at verse 8. You need to bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. In other words, biological ties means nothing in this new era of salvation. It doesn't matter who your parents are, because God can even make stones and rocks to become children of Abraham. What matters is your heart, is repentance, no matter who you are and where you come from. Seriously, if God can make Adam out of dirt, then he certainly can make faithful children of Adam, uh, Abraham out of stones. And, and children here this morning, you need to realize this too. 
Your first question actually asks, am I right with God because my parents are Christians or my parents go to church? Are you right with God because your parents are Christians? And here's the answer, no. I must repent and believe in Jesus. He is the way. I must repent and believe in Jesus. He is the way. Luke is cluing us in here to a very major theme throughout his whole Luke and Acts 2 volume. That with the arrival of the Messiah, a whole new era has dawned. Look at how Luke closes his entire two-volume work in the book of Acts. Just quickly flip all the way to the end of Acts 28. This is the, the last exclamation point in this entire volume. Acts 28, and look at verses 26 and 28. He's quoting Isaiah again. Specifically, he's quoting Isaiah verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. And then look at what he says in verse 28. Acts 28, verse 28. Let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. The emphasis is on the gospel going out to the world. And it's because there's a rottenness in Israel at this time. It was a rottenness of unbelief. They just didn't believe. In fact, back in our context, back in Luke chapter 3, we see John say this exact same thing. Look at verse 9. Luke 3, verse 9, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, that's the context where John is preaching. He, he's in a culture of unbelief. Unbelief is set in. They're religious, sure, but there's no real fruit. There's no evidence of godliness. They're religious, but they're not godly. They pray, but it's not in submission to God. As John puts it here, they're not repentant. They're not relying upon God and his grace. And so John has been sent to prepare the people to call them to repentance. Why? Well, because the Messiah is finally here. It's now. Now's the time. And if you're not ready now, if you've not yet repented, you're going to miss out. You see the urgency in his preaching, don't you? What is repentance? What is repentance? Simply, it means to turn away. Literally, a 180 degree turn away from something sinful and bad and toward God and something good, something true. Children, the second question in your bulletin asks this. What is repentance? What is repentance? And the answer is already in your bulletin. I hope you see it there. I put it because it's a long answer, but it's a good answer. It comes from an older pastor named John Cotton, and he gave this answer to his church. It says, Repentance is a grace of the Spirit, whereby I loathe my sins and myself for them, and confess my sins before the Lord, and seek after Christ for the pardon of my sin, and for grace to serve him in newness of life. Children, I want you to think about this this afternoon with your parents. Think about what it means to mourn over your sin and to confess your sin. Think about what sins you commit, and, and then I want you to confess them to God and pray to God and ask him to forgive you for those specific sins. Here's what strikes me as so interesting in this whole passage. It's the way John preaches but also how Luke describes his preaching. Do, do, do you see what I mean? In verse 7, he's standing before a crowd. He's preaching. The crowd's coming and gathering. And this is what he says, you brood of vipers. And then he taunts them. Who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Like, can you imagine that? We have on one Sunday morning just a, 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 a gaggle of visitors swarming. There's no room to, to sit. Everyone's standing on the sides. And I, I say, you brood of vipers, you, you swamp of snakes, who told you to come to church this morning and find forgiveness? He's not softening his message, is he? He's really not trying to win friends and influence others. John is certainly not a seeker-sensitive kind of preacher. 
And yet, look at how Luke characterizes John's preaching in verse 18. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Luke says that what John is saying and how John is saying it is itself good news for the people. It's the gospel. This shows us that John is an honest preacher. John is an honest preacher. Think about that. John is preaching severe things, like really hard truths, but because it's grounded in the Spirit-inspired Word, in the Scriptures, well, then the Spirit then takes that hard truth. And and, and then when people hear those hard truths, rather than running away, the Spirit does something in them that is an absolute miracle. He helps them. He enables them to stay and listen. They gather, and, 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 and they, they, they just want to be beat up even more. <laughs> they want to hear it more. This is the miracle of gospel-centered, word-saturated preaching. This is the kind of ministry that the Holy Spirit blesses. Not a man who's afraid to offend his hearers, but a man who's afraid to offend his God. The Spirit blesses a man who takes seriously the Word of God and and whose greatest desire is to faithfully communicate and apply that word no matter how hard and uncomfortable it is. And when that happens, so often, the Spirit begins to do the impossible. He makes people to be able to rightly hear that word and respond to that word. But John is honest with God's word, and he lets God do the hard work of changing hearts. John is an honest preacher. And it's a hard word he preaches, isn't it? You need to repent. That means that there are things in your life, habits and practices and thoughts and patterns and words that you will be punished for. Look at the end of verse 7. There is a wrath that is coming. The insatiable judgment of God's Wrath, it's what he describes in verse 17 as the chaff burning in an unquenchable fire. And so unless you acknowledge your sin and then turn away from your sin, then the hard truth is that you stand condemned right now under God's wrath. That's hard news to swallow. But here is why Luke says that's really good news. It's the hard truth You need to see in order to make the change that finds forgiveness. Naturally speaking, we all walk around with blinders on, not seeing ourselves rightly, and so we don't know that we stand condemned. We think we're good people. We compare ourselves to other people, and we're not like so-and-so down the street, but just stand in front of the glory and holiness of God. And all that cleanliness and purity that you thought you had now looks like the slush and snow in the gutter at the end of a a busy day with cars pouring smog all over it unless you acknowledge your sin and then turn away from your sin you stand condemned this is why john is so urgent He knows it's the only hope they have to escape God's wrath. This is why Luke says in verse 18 that John used many exhortations. He was constantly and continually and from every perceivable angle exhorting them, calling them, pleading with them to turn from sin and to turn to God. There's this spirit-empowered boldness in John so that he can preach difficult truths and yet still the people stay. They want to hear more of it. Just as a caveat, I found this to be true in gospel preaching today. In the churches where soft messages that tickle people's ears are preached, either they're very large with shallow hypocrites, or they're very small because they can get the same thing on the Hallmark Channel. But in the churches where the gospel and the word of God is preached in all of its hardness, you find a depth And you find a slow growth. Oh, may the Lord be pleased to keep elders and pastors here that do that. Again, this is why the language of Isaiah 40 is so beautiful too. And such good news. Because when we see our sin, 
when we're led to repent and turn away from our sin. Then we turn and we now see the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And when we see him, what we want to do is we want to run to him. We want to hide ourselves in Jesus, knowing that he alone is our protection. He alone is our forgiveness from the Father's wrath. And so Isaiah 40, all the valleys need to be filled. All the mountains need to be flattened. Why? Because there needs to be nothing in the way keeping us from our Savior. And it's God who opens up the way. Think about that. The very God who stands ready to condemn those who do not repent is the same God who makes open a clear and easy way to Jesus. He's not left us without salvation. And that's glorious good news. It's true, isn't it? That the longer you've walked down that path of rebellion, the harder it seems to get back to God. Perhaps it's been years of prayerlessness. Years of decision, decisions which have hardened your heart and have added sin upon sin upon sin. You know what you need to do, but increasingly you find yourself more enslaved to these desires and wants. It's easier to keep on sinning than it is to repent. John's preaching here is exactly what's needed. A severe and dire warning that unless you repent, all you can expect is judgment, unending wrath. But if you do repent, if you do turn from your sin and turn to Jesus, you will find that the Lord has made a way without any obstacles at all. There is no mountain you need to climb and no valley you need to descend into. Christ is there. Go to him. Paul, I think, picks up on the exact same imagery in Romans 10, verses 6 through 9. Quote, the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is climbing a mountain to get to, get to Christ, or who will descend into the abyss, going down into a valley to get to Christ. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's good news. There's no 12-step program that you have to work through to get right with God. Turn and believe. It's the good news Paul preached. It's the good news John is preaching here. And friends, that's the good news we still preach today. If you are here this morning and you haven't repented from your sins and in turn put your faith in Jesus Christ, do so now. The only obstacle that is standing in your way is yourself. Confess and turn. John was not only an honest preacher, but he was also a very direct preacher. John was a direct preacher. We see this in verse 10, where the crowds respond to his honesty with the question, well, what then shall we do? In other words, they ask, what does this true repentance look like? And so... John directly applies his preaching to that question in verses 11 through 14. John is essentially giving us the evidence of true repentance. What will it look like if I really repent? We all know, don't we? That we can say, oh yeah, I repent. I'm sorry, but nothing's really changed. How many, how many girlfriends have I counseled leave that boyfriend? That's not a guy you want to marry. He's just saying, I'm sorry, but he continues in the same habits. So what's the fruit, then, that shows us that our repentance is real? Well, he's speaking to a crowd that's apparently made up of different kinds of people. But notice the virtues that John highlights. In verse 11, he says that if you truly repent and turn to God, you'll be generous. You won't be stingy and greedy. Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. In other words, you, you care for those who are in need. And you show your care for them by being really generous. You actually give your stuff to them. John says that if you truly repent and turn to God, you'll be honest. Verse 12 and 13. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Truly repentant people don't swindle people or hustle them. 
Your work is honest work. Because now, you know, God watches and God cares. And and you love people made in God's image. You're not trying to get one over on other people. Third, John says, if you've truly repented and turned to God, you'll be content. Verse 14. Soldiers also asked him, and what shall we do? And he said to them, don't exhort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation. And be content with your wages. You no longer have to exert your authority to shake people down to get more from them. You're content with what you have. Seriously, all of this can be summarized in these words. True repentance is seen in the everyday details of normal life. True repentance is seen in the everyday details of normal life. God is concerned with all of our daily habits and seeing if we're faithful in the ordinary things of life the humdrum of our daily routines. Do you want to see what a life of true repentance looks like? Observe the mom who apologizes to her child when she gets annoyed at their loud playing. Observe the husband who makes sure his wife is cared for ever before buying new golf clubs. Observe the student who has the opportunity to cheat but instead gets a C grade because he refused to look at the answers next to him. Observe the grandmother who selflessly cares for her grandchildren even when no one else notices. Observe the pastor who spends more time praying than he does on social media. Observe the church member who faithfully serves without ever getting any recognition. These aren't extraordinary things. These are ordinary decisions of an extraordinarily transformed life. Children, your third question The third question on the children's bulletin asks, what does repentance look like? Answer, it looks like normal obedience to God. It looks like normal obedience to God. Well, Luke ends our passage this morning with what seems to me to be two more essential characteristics of true gospel preaching. We've already seen that John empowered by the Holy Spirit, was an honest preacher. He preached the truth of God's word no matter how hard the truth was. He was a direct preacher. He applied God's word directly to his audience. Next, we see that John was a Christ-exalting preacher. Look at verse 15 and following. Apparently, the crowds were wondering if John was the Messiah. In other words, his preaching was so impactful that the crowds and people listening were beginning to give more attention to him than they were to his message. They were more in awe of the preacher than in what was being preached. What John does is exactly what any spirit-empowered preacher should do. He pointed away from himself and he pointed toward the Savior, Jesus Christ. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. We'll look more at this later in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus divides between unbelief and belief. What I want you to notice here is that John is absolutely intent on pointing away from himself towards the glory and beauty of Christ. You're not listening to me, he says. I'm glad that you've gathered and I'm glad I've got the crowds because because my preaching is having an impact, but it's not about me. He must increase as I must decrease. J.C. Ryle, the English Anglican preacher said, a minister who is really doing us good will make us think of Jesus every year more and more as we live. Lastly, we see that John was a lowly preacher. He was a lowly preacher. Look at verses 18 through 20. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him For Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Herod had divorced his wife in order to marry his niece. John 
convicted by the truth of God's word and led into boldness by the power of the Spirit, preached the sermon and said, that's wrong. John's honesty as a preacher, his directness as a preacher, his Christ-centered messages as a preacher all led to what? It led to this, his imprisonment, his persecution. In other words, John wasn't being invited by Herod to lead and conduct the palace prayer meeting. John's preaching didn't help him climb the ladder of polite society. Luke is showing us, isn't he, that John was bearing the cross as he made much of Jesus Christ even before Christ went to the cross. Ought not this to be our daily attitude in service to Christ? Sure, I, I preach on Sunday mornings from the pulpit, but every Christian soul in this room is an ambassador for Christ as we scatter out into the world. We know, don't we, that, that, that our, our boldness and directness and honesty and christ centeredness as ambassadors will not help us get a raise at work. You'll be ostracized. You'll be canceled, whatever the persecution tends to look like. But here's our model. We want to be a people that make famous the name of Christ. And oh, how many of us subtly, especially those who are in pastoral ministry, how many of us subtly do that because we think it'll make us famous? Preach Christ. Write books on Christ, authored by, not John. Here's a man who said, I'm devoted to my Savior Christ, no matter what comes. I can't help but think John, sitting in prison, no doubt knew that his end was near, his imminent death. And I wonder if he found contented joy in meditating on his sure future, that the Christ whom he was preaching, would be the Christ who would receive him into glory. Did he hear, as we're about to sing this morning, did he hear the harps eternal ringing on the farther shore as he neared those swollen waters with their deep and solemn roar? Did his soul, though stained with sorrow, fading as the light of day, did he take joy that it would pass swiftly over those waters to that city far away? I'm sure in prison, John could boldly sing, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to the great I am, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Let's pray together now a prayer of response to the word that we've just heard preached. Father, we humbly come before you now, praising your great name. Father, we pray now that you would hear our prayers this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the, for the miracle that it is for us to be able to hold your word now, read from it, and hear our God speak to us through the reading of your word. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who confirms in us and in our hearts, the truth of your word, and helps us to understand it. Father, we pray now as we go from this service, having heard your word preached, that throughout this week, your spirit would guide us, helping us to continue to consider this sermon that John has preached and that uh, Steve has just given to us. Father, we thank you for the fact that we can see some 2,000 years later that John the Baptist preached the same gospel that we preach here at Greenbelt Baptist Church. Father, may we repent of our sins. May we turn from the evil that we do. And that we, may we cling to Christ for our salvation. Father, we, even the believers here, were once just as the people that John preached to. We were the brood of vipers. We were the evildoers, and although we still sin, Father, help us to live lives of repentance, lives that show that we treat others justly, that we care for one another here, brothers and sisters in the church, 
that we think more of the need of our brothers and sisters than of our own desires. Father, give us lives that show that we turn to Christ Jesus for our righteousness because we cannot accomplish it on our own. Father, we ask that you would continue to open our ears and our eyes to the gospel. Father, we pray this morning for those among us who do not know you, that they have not yet given their lives or given their faith or put their faith in, their, in our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that the preaching this morning, the presentation of the gospel, and that your Holy Spirit, Father, would be at work on their hearts this morning. I pray that this church, Greenbelt Baptist, would be a light in the community of the gospel, that we would not shy away from the truth, from the hard truths of the gospel, who turn every human being and show them their sin, and show us, Father, that we are not good enough on our own, but we require a Savior, Jesus Christ. And just as Paul preached there in the wilderness, I pray that the preaching here would turn us and turn those who hear the gospel here at Greenbelt to our Savior, to lives and hearts of repentance. Father, we just pray you give us those hearts of repentance that we cannot do on our own. We have no desire to repent of our sin on our own. We love our sin. Father, we pray all these things in your name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing together from the songbook, number 52, Hark, I Hear the Harps Eternal. I hear the harps eternal ringing on the farther shore as I near those swollen waters with their deep and solemn roar. swiftly o'er those waters to that city far away. Alleluia, 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 praise the Lamb. Alleluia, alleluia, glory to the great I am. Some have crossed before us safely to that land of perfect rest. Can you hear them singing faintly in the mansions of the blessed? to kneel before thy throne. May we join thy saints forever, praising thee.
have just a few announcements this morning. The first one is we have evening service this evening, 6 p.m. right here. If you've never joined us before for evening service, the majority of the time of the service is giving uh, to corporate prayer, giving all everyone who joins the opportunity to pray for one another, uh, pray prayers of praise to the Lord, and prayers of confession to our sin together. So if you are available, we'd love to join with you this evening again at 6 p.m. to worship uh, right here in the sanctuary. Uh, uh, we have a members meeting coming up in, uh, two Sundays from today, April 24th, uh, immediately following the service is our next regular business meeting. Uh, next Friday, we're going to have a Good Friday service uh, right here at the church, uh, joining with Alethea Church from College Park. Um, it's, if you haven't been here very long, we, we get to join with them maybe once or twice a year, and it's quite a blessing to see other local churches who preach the gospel just as we do. And we, it is comforting uh, to our hearts to know that, that they are, we're not here alone. This church, Greenville Baptist, is not here alone. There are other brothers and sisters around the world. And it's just one little glimpse we get to see them uh, and worship with them. So it's a great time. So uh, Good Friday service this coming Friday, 7 p.m. here at the church, April 15th. Um, Bible study on Wednesday, 7 p.m., going through Titus. Uh, we have several uh, adult Sunday schools going on here at the church. There's a, a women's uh, Sunday School Truth Seekers that meets up in the upper classrooms here, 915, going through Thessalonians. And uh, right here, Adult Sunday School in the Sanctuary, we're going through uh, political theory uh, uh, from a biblical worldview. So join us if you can. All right, if you want to stand now for our benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.